I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messengers God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator has sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Muhammad, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. Love and light, everybody. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Today, my guest is Professor Daniel Dennett. Welcome aboard, sir. Good to be with you, Reverend Phil. Glad to have you. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Daniel is a university professor and Austin B. Fletcher professor of philosophy at Tufts University, the Center for Cognitive Studies, and the inaugural Miller Scholar at the Santa Fe Institute. Today's prophetic topic is, Our Lives Will Be Our Prayers. The topic is extracted from a sentence that appears on page 69 of God Without Religion, which was written by Sankara Saranam. The sentence reads as follows, Nurtured by this progressive spirituality, we will look upon the natural world as a house of worship, the book of nature as sacred scripture, the laws of nature as God's commandments, the resonant effects of thoughts on the human organism as the voice of God, and our lives will be our prayers. And where this is leading, you'll find out as we walk the path a little bit. Um, it was about a month ago you did a lecture here in Santa Fe. The title was Wild and Domesticated Religions, How the Machinery of Religion Evolved. And then I'm going to just read this, the subtext was religions have probably changed more in the last two centuries than they changed in the last two millennia and perhaps they will change more in the next 20 years than they have in the last two centuries and there's a bunch of points that we're going to touch on from that but even before we get into that can you just introduce yourself to the audience other than what I've said about you sure so uh, I'm a philosopher, but I'm also a cognitive scientist. I work in the area of consciousness research, brain research, and evolutionary theory. And for many years, I've been looking at the evolution of human culture, and in particular, recently, the evolution of religion. That is from a completely naturalistic standpoint. If, if Martians came to Earth, Martian scientists came to Earth and looked at the planet one of the things that would really strike them as remarkable is uh, the time and energy we spend in, in religious ceremonies, gathering in the religious ceremonies. They'd want to know what this was all about. How did this start? Why does it happen? Uh, and that's, those are the naturalistic questions about religion. So uh, I'm primarily interested in religion as a natural phenomenon like music or sport or uh, crime, for that matter. They're all natural phenomena. Uh, and uh, how they tick, why they work the way they are, and how we might tweak them so that we got more value from them in the future. Do you come from a religious background? Do you have a religious practice? <laughs> um, no. Uh, yes and no. I, I went to Sunday school in a in a congregational church in Massachusetts, very liberal Protestant denomination, sort of suburban liberal Protestantism. But I went to Sunday school and learned the books of the Bible and memorized some psalms, and I've sung in a lot of choirs. Uh, when I was a teenager, I went through a brief period, as many kids do, uh, of sort of intense curiosity about religion. But then I just... The creed just did not impress me at all, and I realized it was not a big thing. I just realized, no, I was an atheist and walked away from that. And you maintained the atheism? Oh, yeah. I uh, maintained it in the simple sense that I hardly gave it any thought. It was I was not, as it were, a militant atheist. I was one of those, it's obvious, atheists who doesn't bother thinking about it. And it was only in the 
uh, uh, early part of this century when uh, I thought that the uh, religious right was becoming uh, dangerous and offensive uh, and we had to start thinking more carefully about our practice of just leaving religion alone and that no this is this is an important and a very important phenomenon and maybe a dangerous one and we should study it carefully to see what we should do about it a couple of questions come to mind coming from yeah i mean would you not be as bias, so to speak, coming from an atheist point of view as somebody who was you know, raised in you know, Roman Catholic and became part of their ministry? I think everybody approaches everything they do in life with a set of presumptions based on what they've experienced in their lives. And I'm, I don't think that there's even any point in trying not to, trying to shed all of that. So sure, I approach the pro, uh, the, these projects with hunches, attitudes, experiences that no doubt reflect how I go about it. But as a researcher, I try seriously to set that aside, to identify it, to mark it. After all, that's, that's what you do in science. You, you try to remove observer bias from whatever it is you're doing. And there's ways of checking to see if you're succeeding in that. Uh, so. I'm sure I don't entirely succeed, but that's the goal. That's the uh, uh, just. If we took if we took the idea seriously that 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 you can't study religion in an unbiased way, then what we're going to do? Just go play tennis or something and give up? This is much too important a phenomenon to uh, to just decide. Well, some things in life you just don't research. Maybe we ought to break down some terms first, because I guess my first question to you is, are you combining God and religion in the same definition, or is God separate from religion? Well, uh, I define religions as, as, as social institutions that encourage uh, the profession of a belief in a supernatural agent or agents who's uh, approval is to be sought. That distinguishes it from black magic. And uh, so I, I build uh, the concept of God or gods into the very definition of religion. Now that means that arguably some things which are generally considered religions, like some kinds of Buddhism, wouldn't count as religions. Okay, we can, we can include them as interesting exceptions, but but we need a definition of some sort. That's mine. One of the things we had talked about right before we got on the air was then where does, if any place, the concept of, and maybe we ought to define it, spirituality fit in? Well, that's something I've given some thought to, and it's fascinating to me that so many people nowadays, at least in, in America, say... Uh, religion's not for me, but spirituality is. Uh, you know, I'm a, a very spiritual person, but but not a religious person in the sense that I don't want to belong to any congregation. I don't want to participate in any uh, rituals of any organized sort. Or if they do, they're homemade rituals or they're something like that. So uh, what is that all about? Um, I think that one can be very cynical about that and say, People just are embarrassed not to be going to church anymore the way their parents and grandparents did. And they say they're spiritual. And that might mean that they, they have a really, really deep and passionate commitment to, oh, uh, you know, the Green Bay Packers. Or, <laughs> or the environment. Or uh, social justice. Or anything else. And it has nothing to do with God. It is, a, it is simply a, the, the sense. Now, this is not something to be cynical about. I think anybody who has a deep and abiding conviction that there are much more important things in this life than their personal well-being and prosperity and happiness, anybody who thinks what you should do in this life is 
devote yourself to something that's more important than you are. There's a sense in which that's spirituality. And that's wonderful. And that would be a good definition of spirituality. And what if, I mean, I'll throw it out there. My studies of the various religions are that they all teach that. Most people who practice those religions don't practice that, but they're all being taught by those religions. I think that's right up to a, I think that's right. I think there's variations on that. I think every, every organized religion nowadays uh, preaches some version of that, namely there are very important things, more important than you, things that you'll never completely understand, and you should respond to them with awe and humility and with a desire to make the world better. And most of the religions... But, but it's Go interesting, ahead. you mentioned the title of my, of my talk was uh, Wild and Domesticated Religions. That's not true of wild religions. Uh, wild religions, the, the, the predecessors of organized religion, uh, uh, don't foster that. They, they, they don't even have a concept of faith. They don't need one because they don't distinguish religion from just what everybody knows, you know, lore. Science and, and natural history and religion are all one for them. And uh, that sense of, uh, well, you know, maybe it's respect for the gods, but it's as much fear. It's as much practical if you don't do this, this, and this, you're going to get struck by lightning, or you're not going to eat. So, so th this attitude towards spirituality is itself, in some regards, a, a rather recent development in religion. You're talking about the ancient religion, so, I mean, the oldest one, pretty much, is shamanism in its various different forms. Yeah, yeah. I believe that outgrowths of shamanism are Native American spirituality here in the Southwest, sure, sure. Taoism in, yeah. in, in the East, and the, you know, a variety of other practices in between. What I mean, you know, you, the multiple gods. I mean, my belief is that they were something that was given to somebody as a means of focus but that the underlying belief was there is only one God. They were talking about manifestations of gods, very similar to the Hindu practice, for instance. And it was just, you know, that gave us, I mean, just like the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, where it's, I don't know how many thousands of saints. You know, it's, it's yeah. about giving somebody a focus, but underneath it, there's really only, you know, quote, one. Well, um as a as a speculation about history, I don't think that's very likely. It seems pretty clear to me that polytheisms, many gods, came first, and that the idea of monotheism, the idea that there's one god or that there's a central and highest god, is a, is a fairly recent. That is to say, it's only a couple thousand years old. Where do you trace that back to? Well. Probably to uh, the Judaism, uh, pre-Christian Judaism, and, and Yahweh or Jehovah, sort of, who says, don't have any other gods. That's right there in the first commandment. And, uh, but the fact that you've got to have that commandment, that's, that, that's a bit of a novelty. Because up till then, religions had lots of gods. How about pre-Hindu Vedant, for instance, or the Himalayans. I mean, that, that to uh, me I don't know enough about it. The, may, maybe there is a, something like a monotheistic tradition there, I, I, if you dig back far enough. I don't know myself. It might be. Because that's the way I, my understanding of it would be. I mean, it's just... That there's... How do I want to say this? I think all the religions teach both, which gets confusing. You know, and that they, you know, I mean, Hinduism, Buddhism, Buddhism was just an, ex 
to me was nothing but an extraction of Hinduism trying to get back to its original roots. That's what a lot of people think, yeah. yeah. I think maybe true, yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, Buddha was kind of trying to bring it back to its original, so he was, t one of his statements that's attributed to him was if there's such a thing as gods, they're as messed up as we are, not worthy of our worship, you know, which was kind of bringing mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. where Hinduism had kind of grown out into. So you're saying wild is is a non-structured kind of... The comparison is with the difference between wild and domesticated animals. Domesticated animals all evolved from wild precursors. Whether it's the aurochs, which is the ungulate, the, 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 the cow, in effect, the, the proto-cow from which all domestic cows uh, evolved, or, or the wild sheep from which domestic sheep, wild goats, and so forth, wild horses. All of, all of these domesticated animals uh, were domesticated in fairly recent times, within the last 10,000 years from wild ancestors. And in the process, at least some of them went through a period when they were so-called synanthropes or synanthropic. They, they lived in the company of people, but they weren't domesticated. We still have synanthropic species around today, uh, rats and mice and squirrels, for instance. They're not, they're not domesticated. Nobody owns them. Yeah. I mean, you may feed the squirrels, or the rats for that matter, but, but unless you're a lab researcher, you, you don't own them. Uh, they're, not, they're not domesticated in that sense. Um, they're, they're wild, but they're not wild. And I think religions are the same sort of thing. Uh, they originally were superstitions, in effect, that grew up that nobody was in charge of them. They didn't have any, there were no authorities so the, the, by the time you get the shamans, you're already on the way towards domestication because the, the shamans are picking up these folkloric elements which just emerged by cultural evolution and beginning to harness them and use them for p particular purposes. And that's, that's the path which has the Roman Catholic Church and the Baptists and so forth as the most recent and most highly domesticated varieties. And as they evolved, they became more restrictive and more constrictive. Many things happened. First of all, as they evolved, um, just like cows and dogs, uh, people, rightly or wrongly, sought to adjust them to fit their purposes better. And so we get many breeds of cows which are supposed to be better for, for human purposes, not for the cows. It's, 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 they're for us now. Yeah. yeah. Oroxes were just for oroxes, but cows are for us. And the early wild religions were just for themselves. But today's religions are for us. And, and they've been patiently tweaked and adjusted and redesigned through, uh, you know, the Council of Nicaea and Vatican II and, and Martin Luther and, and L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, they all have come in to design, redesign religions to serve human purposes. Are they serving... Human purposes or are they serving individual purposes? There's a good question. And I give an answer which is surprising, I think, to many people. I say there's much less devious uh, redesign for human purposes than you might think. There has been, I, I would say, and I'll probably get sued for it. L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> made up Scientology out of whole cloth to make a lot of money, and he sure succeeded. Um, uh, but I okay. think most of the, I think that's the rare exception, actually. I think most of the adjustment 
that's happened in religions has been in one sense innocently conceived. That is, I don't think we have to conjure up secret cadres or cabals of sly priests figuring out how to Im increase their political power by doing X, Y, and Z. I think that's happened, of course. But I think mainly they thought they were making the religion pure and better for the purposes that they were announcing that the religion was for us, for the greater glory of God. Now, people can be self-deceived when they do this, of course. So my next question kind of might be a strange question. If you don't believe in God, then do you, how, how do you enter into the concept, do you enter into the concept of duality? What do you mean by duality? That each one of us has a higher and lower self. Each one of us, I, you know, like the old cartoons when I was a kid, the devil on one shoulder, the angel oh. on the other shoulder. Oh, sure. I think, I think there's, that's a, a, a vivid metaphor for something perfectly real. I think that we all have our better self, which is very much influenced by our friends and family and, and our elders and, and tradition. And that's who we'd like to be. That's who we think we are in our better moments. And then there's our uh, less presentable self that we lapse into in private and when things are going badly. And I think it's very important that uh, we get a lot of help from our friends. Without their even trying, they're just their presence brings out the best in us very often. That's why it's so important. That's why parents are right to worry about the companions of their children. Because if their children fall in among bad companions, this will drag them down just as sure as anything. And if they fall in among good, good kids, their own less good impulses will be uh, somewhat diminished, blocked, thwarted, resisted, because they want, to, they want their peers to respect them and to look up to them. Where does, in this whole philosophy, how do you explain prophets, messengers? Um, how do you explain somebody like Jesus, somebody like Buddha, somebody like Muhammad, uh, Sarosta, somebody, you know, any of yeah. those people? I think they were uh, human beings with unusual talents and unusual, uh, un unusually intense commitments to ideas and that they uh, were charismatic and that they, uh, at their best, they did a lot of good. And if they attributed that to something that was greater than themselves, I mean, Jesus in particular, I mean, the miracles he performed, hmm. how does that fit in? Well, um, first of all, I don't believe that he actually committed a, uh, performed any miracles, as I don't think miracles have ever happened. Uh, but, and I don't, feel shy about that, uh, that opinion because it seems to me we know a lot about how stories get embroidered and why and how the appeal of miracle stories vastly outstrips the evidence for them. So of course we're going to have miracle stories for the same reason that we have all the urban legends that we have. So I don't, th I don't think there have been any miracles. I think there have been some wonderful occasions. I think that uh, to, to get sort of close to home about some issues, I think that a charismatic person with a sort of hypnotic touch can often achieve remarkable results in 
alleviating pain and suffering and can even contribute to putting, say, a disease into remission, I don't think that's a miracle. I think that's a very, very strong placebo effect, and shamans have been using it for thousands of years. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Dr. Herbert Benson decided through his own experience that he did not like the concept of placebo effect. He called it remembered wellness. And Is this the same Benson that did the study, the Templeton study on intercessory prayer? I'm not at, sure. At Harvard, Harvard Medical School? He's, he was the founder, and he's, I think he's still the head of the Harvard Medical School's Mind one, Body then. Institute. Yeah, yeah. His third book was Timeless Healing. And chapter six or chapter seven was the, what he wanted to title the book, and the publisher wouldn't let him do it. But he, his research at that point had gotten to a place where he said, we were wired for God. And then he got, did this big study funded by the Templeton Foundation on intercessory prayer. And it, it, it was a very elaborate and carefully done study, and it went on for a number of years. And the results were finally published, I think, in 2007. I wanted to talk about it in my book, but it, my book came out just weeks before they finally and belatedly revealed the results. And the results were undeniable. They were really carefully done. Intercessory prayer doesn't work. Were the studies back in the 80s that were done by Duke University and North Carolina University, I think Duke was first and North Carolina tried to replicate it. They both got the same results, which was saying that it did work. Well, I'm not sure, but I know that the Benson study was by far the most careful and uh, most rigorous study. And uh, it showed that there was only one significant effect, and that was negative. So... In fact, in the wake of the Benson study, uh, I and some other people began to say, look, folks, we now have really solid evidence about this. There's a serious question about whether we should just tolerate churches declaring the power of intercessory prayer. If some organization were to, were to be touting the curative powers of some snake oil, and we had a study like this which said it doesn't work, the FDA would throw those people in jail as frauds. So I think, in fact, the claim that intercessory prayer works has to be viewed today as metaphorical. And if you claim that you've got proof, you are uh, flying in the face of the best scientific evidence. So people who have had experiences coming back with the help of somebody who was, let's say, an energy healer, coming back from serious illness. So you, you feel that that's all attributable just to the Combination of spontaneous remission and placebo effects, sir. Uh, well, let me look through, back this up. We don't, you know, it's, this, is a, this is an ancient ancient issue. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, of the ancient Greek who, who uh, was shown the uh, uh, statues of thanksgiving that had been erected by uh, all the, the, the sailors who's, who, you know, who, for, who's, who'd been saved from, from shipwreck and drowning by the prayers of their, of their uh, 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 families, and uh, uh, the uh, let's see if I can get this right. The wh whoever the ancient commentator was, he said, <laughs> "Think how many more statues there'd be if so many others that have been prayed for hadn't drowned." <laughs> Isn't you know, that's a that's a broad question, but. All the advances we're making in scientific understanding, mm -hmm. isn't that going to the opposite direction, proving that there is something that is coordinating? No, I don't think so. 
How then uh, quantum physics? What about it? To me, quantum physics is nothing more than a restatement of basic karma, something that has been... <laughs> well, um, I don't know if you get the physicists to agree with you. I, uh, um, quantum physics seems to me to be uh, amazing physics and really interesting, but I don't think it has any implications like that. So all of this happens without some kind of mm -hmm. guidance or coordination? Yes. Yep. Okay. So how do we go about measuring... I mean, are we measuring faith? Are we measuring belief? How do we separate the two? <clears throat> well, you ask a good question but to me because I've been thinking about how to measure belief now for about 40 years professionally and uh, tried to develop a theory about how you can tell what people believe and when. And it turns out to be very hard. Um, not just because people often dissemble, they often pretend to believe one thing when they actually believe another. Um, but because the idea of looking in their brains and just as we're reading off their beliefs, that's, that's forlorn. Forget it. Anybody who tells you that we can do that is uh, more than exaggerating. Um, sure, we will, as, as neuroscience matures, as cognitive neuroscience matures, we'll be able even to say, well, this person right now is, is thinking about football, or this person is uh, recalling a visit to Paris, or, you know, that's, that's within, that's not within grasp today, but we're getting close. But the step from that to and this is this person's deepest beliefs. That is a fraught with peril, that, that inference. Um, we, we'll make some progress on it. And as we get better and better theories about how belief resides in people's heads, we will, we will close that gap to some degree. But um, uh, beliefs don't get measured in any easy way. You have to have an elaborate theoretical edifice to uh, figure out what somebody's believing. That's why I was asking the question. I mean, I've had numerous experiences. You, know, I, you and I haven't had much time to talk. People watching the show know parts of my story. I'm a recovering drug addict. Um, I got my recovery. Good and for you. That's wonderful. Still, man, thank you. Actually, you know, it's interesting you say that because it's like if I would have run out of a burning building, nobody would have said that. Yeah. <laughs> Even if I was yeah, burning right. the building yeah. down myself. Congratulations, you saved your life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Um, yeah. So I've been, I've been part of a 12-step program now for a little over 22 years, 22 and a half years. And it, it, it's a spiritual program. Mm -hmm. And it talks about in the second step coming to believe. And uh, there was a lot of resistance on my part to that because of my experience with religion. As a child, I didn't see, I saw religion and God as being one, and therefore I saw no value to either one of them because of the way I saw a lack of being demonstrated. I've had numerous experiences prior to getting clean where I use the term preponderance of evidence, that there was something looking out for me because this, the nature of the consequences I experienced were not as severe as they should have and could have been based upon mm -hmm. my actions mm -hmm. at the time. But then after I got clean, I've had experiences which yeah, we could call coincidence once or twice, where me and somebody else were in one place at one time, never been there before, never been there again, and they were there to teach me something at just the right time I needed it, or I was to have an experience through that. So, you know, I have a belief and I have a faith. I don't have a ritual practice. I do a lot mm -hmm. of meditation. I believe in... Mm -hmm 
in, a, in prayer, but it's not as structured mm -hmm. as any of the religions have it. How do I, how do I deconstruct all those experiences? Well, I don't know the details, of course. So, but I can give you some general, some general responses. Um, uh, let me compare your experience. Would you like me to give you a specific example? Well, well, um, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. And, but then. There's a general point I want to come back to, but go ahead. Give us okay. a specific example. Yeah, because I mean, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it. Mm -hmm. One of my teachers mm -hmm. was a Sufi saint. He's still alive. He, he lives mm -hmm. in London. Just to make a short story shorter, because I tend to make them longer, I was with him, and we were... I we had been like a month between the time I'd seen him and the time we were back together again, and I had a bunch of questions that came out of my first visitation with him, and he was sitting there and answering all these questions for me. And I need to understand that he is part of what is known as the Nakshabandi sect of Sufism, which okay. is okay. Never heard of it, but go ahead. Nakshabandi, what distinguishes them from most of the other Sufi cults is that they, or well, Sufi sects, I'm not sure if I know the difference between the two, um, they trace their lineage back to Abu Bakr, who was Muhammad's right-hand man. All the rest of the Sufi sects trace their lineage back to Ali, which was a stepson. The thing that distinguishes also them is they believe in the process of a clean heart. That's their big thing. So I'm sitting there answering all these questions. We're around this circular table. There's five or six other people that are having their own conversations. And it, what I didn't know was the end, which became the end. I asked him, you know, is there anything else I need to know? And he goes, one more thing. And at that point, Professor, he put... Two, I had one or two fingers right on my heart, right here. Mm -hmm. I was gone. I mean, totally gone. I don't know for how long. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I went. I was mm -hmm. just out in some other world. Mm -hmm. It lasted. I came back after however many much time. The euphoria that accompanied that actually lasted through until like sometime that Monday. This happened on mm -hmm. a Friday. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, I've had meditations. I've done all kinds of strange things on drugs. This, this was, like, different than anything I've ever experienced. Okay, yeah. Totally yeah. unprepared, unaware, just, yeah. just, and I was gone. I mean, so how would you explain that? Well, uh, never heard about anything quite like that, but I've heard of things that are similar. Um, in fact, you can, you can get a, quite a good... Uh, how to do it manual uh, in a in a famous film that was made in 1972 by uh, um, Marjo Gortner. Um, and the film was called Marjo. It won an Academy Award in 1972 as the best documentary of the year. It's a very curious film. Uh, I guess you you don't know this film well. I don't remember the film. I remember him. He Marjo was a, Gortner. He was a cult leader. Well, leader. well, it was a little different. When he was a little kid in short pants, when he was four or five years old, he was the world's youngest evangelist, and he was preaching brim, fire and brimstone and and sin and damnation and and quoting scripture. He made a lot of money for his parents going around the revivals tent circuit. Then he dropped out as a teenager, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll intervened. And then he came back in his mid-twenties, I would say, and reestablished himself as a revival preacher. Only now there was a difference. In fact, now he didn't believe a word of it. And he was a con artist. And he had a film that he made where, where, a, where a crew, a film crew, went around and he... And he uh, uh, prepped them all on how to be, you know, no cigarettes, no swearing. You've got to be holy, 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 because we're going to tell everybody that we're making this wonderful documentary about how I've been saved 
uh, uh, to devote my life to Jesus once again. But it, what the film is is a backstage look at how the revival business actually works. And one of the things that we, we see in the film is he's leading these revival meetings, and it comes time for the for the decision for Christ. People are being saved. They're being born again, and they're lining up, and they're coming along, and he's laying his hands on them, and they have a stack of sort of rugs piled up there and they have people standing because so many of the people are basically fainting. And he tells you backstage afterwards how he does it. And the trick is in faking out he, he didn't know the details of how the brain works. I, I learned some more about this. It's a matter of timing. If I, if I come up to you and you're expecting me to touch you, but I accelerate the touch by just a little bit and I touch in the right place, of course, you have to be set up for this. Mm -hmm. You have to be ready, ready, ready. The mismatch between the arrival of that signal and your expectation can, it's like, it's like a reset button on your brain. And, and it's a trick. And there are others. Now, I don't know if this Sufi saint sounds, my first hunch is, I bet he's got a bunch of those tricks. And he knew this was the best one to do on you. I would not see how that would be. I mean, th there was no setup. There was nothing that was asked well, you of me. You told me about the setup. You asked him all these questions. He gave you all these answers. You were, you, you weren't watching a television show. You were really, really engaged in this activity. This, this man was at the very center of your attention, was he not? Understood that, but and when we're talking about you know, a lot of these faith healings, I, you know, because people are set up. They're there, to, they're there because they already want to believe. And they're there because they're expecting an outcome. I mean, I was not expecting this to happen. And, and I, I just, I can't account So much for the better. So you, that's just spontaneous. I mean, you could come up and poke me and wouldn't, say, you know, I doubt if it would send me I out I doubt if it would. Yeah. Uh, I but, mean, but, but that's because, uh, uh. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you another uh, one of my favorite experiments on hypnotism. Hypnotism is used a lot in medicine, not as, not as much as some people want, more than others do. But it, there's there's an established literature, scientific literature, on how to use hypnotism for um, um, stopping pain. You, you, uh, uh, yeah. uh, some dentists use it very effectively. Okay, so there's. I once taught a course on this, and we had a. a, a the person who teaches hypnotism uh, uh, at Tufts Medical School uh, actually teaches courses in hypnotism at Tufts Medical School, come out and, and do some demonstrations and talk with us. But one of the papers we read for that sa session was a very clever paper that was done where uh, two hypnotists, these were both very good hypnotists, they were both you know, black belts, as it were, in hypnotism, <laughs> well-trained, and they were given the task of hypnotizing two groups of subjects, group A and group B. Group A was told hypnotist Alpha, his you know, world champion hypnotist, president of the Hypnotism Association, so hypnotist B just got his diploma. The other group was told just the opposite. And each of them succeeded beautifully at hypnotizing the people in the group that were told that they were big monkey monk world expert and, and really had a hard time hypnotizing people when they were told that they were novices. Mm -hmm. so, so reputation has a lot to do with it. So you're, I, can ima I can't imagine a better reputation have than to be a Sufi saint Boy, probably I could hypnotize people if somebody thought I was a Sufi saint. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I'm not going to go to all the effort to, to find out. But no, I'm just saying I, I don't. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. You know. Okay. Uh, no, I don't expect. Yeah. I don't expect you to, to to believe to believe me. And and I even, 
In a way, I don't want you to believe me. I'll tell you why. Okay. You are getting a lot of good value from your beliefs in this. And why should I want to interrupt that or disturb it? I, if, if it helps you, great. And, and, and if, if I talked you out of it, well, shame on me. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, so is you're going to have to live with the fact that maybe these things have scientific explanations after all. What if I said to you, science is just nothing more than a means of proving that God does exist? That science is, is an attempt to understand how God works? Well, you know, that has an ancient tradition. Spinoza, for instance, um, his famous way of characterizing it is God or nature. He thought God and nature were one and the same thing. And so this permitted him to say, the best way to study God is to be a scientist. That is, that's the way to understand God, is to study nature with all curiosity and reverence. Now, now that's a lovely, that's a beautiful idea. And in fact, uh, uh, I, I wish I could just endorse it. The trouble is that for most people, it, it carries implications that I think are both unnecessary and, and misleading. Wouldn't science fit your earlier definition of a religion? No. No, because there's no supernatural agency whose, whose approval is sought. There's a, science is an institution, a set of institutions, that is characterized by a particular attitude towards truth. And it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any uh, holy dogmas, there aren't any sacred scripts. And, no. and that's, that's, why it isn't, that's why it isn't a religion. I mean, not every religion is asking you to, I mean, Taoism, the first line in the Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be described is not the Tao. They're not asking you to look for it. Yep. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, Buddhism is similar. Well, there's, there's lots of wonderful institutions that do various things. Music, for instance, fantastic. Wouldn't want to live without music. And, but it's not a religion. It's a wonderful thing. And maybe Taoism is a wonderful thing that isn't religion. Science is a wonderful thing that isn't religion. Professional sport pretty good thing. It's not religion, but for some people it seems to be. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, look, uh, don't, don't, you know, at least there's something that they really care about. <laughs> Isn't that important? So where do you see these studies going? What, what do you see as the ultimate result from them? What I would love to see is for the proven power of creating sort of cohesive moral communities that we get out of organized religions. That's one of the benefits that come from them if we follow you, you the, the betcha, teachings. You betcha. And no, I don't think there are any secular institutions that are as good at, at creating what we might call moral teamwork as religions are. I would love to see that power harnessed more responsibly and more rationally. Now, maybe it can't be. Maybe, maybe the irrationality that is built into uh, um, pretty much all religion is is a necessary ingredient. You can't get the you can't get the commitment. You can't get the um, the willingness to devote your life to the cause without a, without a healthy dose of irrationality thrown in. I, I don't want to believe that. The irrationality, basically, then, if you don't do this, you burn in hell. For instance. It's just... Or you don't listen it, to us, you're excommunicated. Well, you know, uh, 
religions, organized religions, tend to not only tolerate irrationality, but even to glorify it in certain regards, to honor it, and and to honor the the uh, refusal by its adherents to consider alternatives to some of the central theses. You're not even supposed to think about that. Now, that's a very powerful idea. You know, don't even think about an alternative to this. Well, uh, it's a very powerful idea that can be abused. Sometimes you think, come on, folks, think about it. You really, you got heads, you got minds. Think about these issues. Yes, you've been taught for a thousand years, don't do X. Now, take a deep breath, be brave, think about whether that rule really is right. And and I would rather uh, uh, tie my fate to an open-ended use of reason than to any traditional set of principles that you weren't supposed to think about. I think I think... Don't think about it. It's okay with kids. With children, you say, I'm not going to tell you the reason. I'm just going to tell you, do not do that. They're not old enough to think it through. But I think, you know, we're adults now. Human race has got to the point where we can think about whatever we want to. I think that what you're saying is, I, I, I support it. I believe it. I believe it's one of the reasons where Religion is becoming obsolete. It, I, I think they've lost sight of their their purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I see the purpose of religion, it's to take the uninitiated and initiate them, which is a breaking down of the self will as opposed to the the God will, the spirit will, the greater good to get self out of it. So whether it's Judaism, which is uh, six hundred and thirteen daily commandments, um, you know the various ways they do it with the various Christian denominations from sacraments to, to confessionals to mm. all that stuff. To, I mean, even Islam, with it's, you know, five times a day bowing and praying, it's, it's to, to break down that self-will. But where I think they get stuck is then they keep you stuck there and they don't allow you to advance. If you mm. start to question this, you know, then we either excommunicate well, this, you or yeah. they send you out into the desert like one of the other... You know, but you know, this, is, this, is, this, this really is a serious problem, uh, and I think, you put your, I think you put your finger on it. Uh, when I get really worried about this, uh, I have a little thought experiment, so let me try it on you. Okay, suppose that the nation faces some terrible peril from, from a really dangerous, let's say, terrorist army of some sort. So we are going to have to. We're going to have to go to war. We're going to have to send an army out to defend ourselves. Okay. Now I give you a choice between two armies. They're equally well equipped. They're equally well trained. Okay. Army A believes that they are in the service of God. Army B is composed of highly trained economists. Now, which army do you want out there? <laughs> well, that that presupposes I, I buy into that hold that this is the only option to deal with. Well, I wouldn't want either army. <laughs> no, neither. N no, neither. Neither would I. But 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 it but it it dramatizes. I'm pre quite prepared to grant that uh, an army made up of total skeptics like an organization made up of total skeptics. It's like herding cats. It's hard, to, it's hard to get cohesion and allegiance and loyalty and obedience, all those sometimes very, very good virtues. It's hard to get them if, if, if you can't have the crutch of irrational belief to support it. I think that's a serious problem. Let's hold that thought. I've got to make a couple of announcements. We're almost running out of time, and then we'll come right back to that. Um, 
our friends at Unity Santa Fe, which is 1212 Unity Way, which is off of New Mexico 599, the relief route, have two things going on this week. On Friday, April 16th at 7 p.m. is Spiritual Cinema, and they're showing Something Unknown. This award-winning documentary is a fascinating spiritual journey into the science behind psychic phenomena. Why can some people cure themselves in the late, last stages of cancer? Where is the boundary between real psychic powers and fraud? These questions and more will be explored and answered in this intriguing feature documentary by Dutch filmmaker René Schettelup. Anyway. You don't want me to pronounce it, I can't. And there's a love offering attached to that. And then on Sunday, April 18th at 1 o'clock, Law of Attraction by Reverend Julie Summers. Workshop will offer an opportunity for participants to look at times in their lives when they gave up their power of conscious creation and to rewrite the script, learn intuitive tools to release unwanted thoughts and emotions and explore what is behind current circumstances in their life that was created, that has created what is not wanted. Also a love offering on this. So for more information, call 505-989-4433. Also, um, just to let you know that I will be here next week. My guest will be Andreas Goldman, who is an intuitive healer, and we'll talk about spirit and healing. And let's get back to our guest for the last couple of minutes. We're not going to be able to... Resolve any of these things. No, no, I, no, I wanted to get into a little bit more deeper than that, but we, we're going to have the time for it. So let me ask you, parting thought, what would you like to leave this audience with? And I know you want to make a quick announcement about yeah. looking for research for yourself. Yeah. Um, with a researcher, Linda Lascola, we've done a study of preachers, preachers who have congregations, who have a pulpit, who have a parish, who are actually secret non-believers. They don't believe what their con congregations believe. They may, they, they may be spiritual, they may, but they don't believe the creed of their own churches. And there are a lot of them, and they're in a tough position. And we, we've interviewed some, and that's published. You can find it in On Faith, the Washington Post Newsweek website, On Faith. You can Google that and you'll find it. Our article has been published also in the journal Evolutionary Psychology. We're, that was a pilot study. We only had five. We want to find other brave ministers, pastors, who in complete confidence are willing to be interviewed about how they deal with the fact that they don't believe what their congregations think they believe. So those of you watching, if you are interested, there is a website that's being shown on the screen underneath the professor's name. If you get yep. to that website, it'll connect you directly to him. And you, again, complete confidentiality. If you want to participate in it, please do. Don't feel you know, like you won't be honored. You will be. Quick parting thought. we got a minute. I've enjoyed talking with you. I think you've raised important issues. I think that uh, the power of spirituality in its various guises to uh, help people who need help and to strengthen people who are either strong or not so strong, is undeniable. People ask me, uh, you know, do I want to abolish religion and abolish spirituality? I say, no. I, I want to replace religion with better, with better institutions. And uh, I think uh, what you're doing is, is, is part, of that good, part of that good way of doing it. Thank you. A couple of things, I'm just going to throw them out to you and for the audience as well, to people watching. The uh, mm -hmm. book, which I quoted from at the beginning, which is God Without Religion, is a fantastic book. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, you might want to read it. The other one is The Evolution of God by Chris Grissom. Um, so, folks, until next week, thank you for tuning in. I um, hope you got something from this. And questioning beliefs is not, nothing wrong with that, so... My belief is that you are all one with God. Walk in love and light and demonstrate it. Thank you. I'm Reverend Phil, and I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more Words of the Prophets.